Shea. I'm a 20-year experienced junior architect and AEC professional. I am a BIM expert, implementation specialist, and Revit consultant. I have worked on Revit projects in over 30 different disciplines, 5 countries, 15 states, and I have worked on Revit projects in every occupancy type. As a trainer and consultant, I have taught at seven schools and five Autodesk training centers. I have taught over 2,000 professionals in Revit in two countries and 15 states. I have been teaching engineers, architects, and artists how to draw for over 20 years. Feel free to follow me on LinkedIn and YouTube and enjoy the videos. because I'm turning on the recorder okay so what we're going to go over today is uh, this will be part one of our um, three-day series uh, or not more than three days uh, so we're basically kind of setting up a um, all of our lunch and learns for a few weeks will be um, call it the building design series or whatever so we'll do uh, SD and then into DD and then into CD and then uh, stuff like that so we're gonna be going over kind of overall concepts of how to make Revit models in sort of a conceptual way um, so the first thing we're gonna do is talk about um, imported objects and um, massing in Revit so uh, what we're looking at right here is um, an import. So this comes from 3ds Max here. So um, you, Revit imports almost any 3D file, um, but it has to be either a SketchUp, a Rhino, or a what is called a true solid format. So. Um, true solid formats are anything that you send to a printer. They fall under the category of an STL, a SATA, um, a DWG is also a true solid. So you just can't save your 3ds Max as a 3ds Max and then import it because Revit won't read it. But just as long as it uh, you export it, um, you can import it into Revit. So if you're using a weird program like um, soft damage or something like that you just go up here and you export it as a different type so 3ds max is a great program because you can import anything and then you can export any type so a very good type that's always good to use in revit is autocad and then the second best is sata which is this one acis sata both of these read very well so depending on what you're doing in revit um depends on how you uh, calculate your 3D stuff when you begin. So what I did is I came in, I made these shapes real quick, and I just exported it as a DWG. So then all I did was import this. Um, so you can come up here and import this, and of course I lost my file path. Um, so what I'm going to do is just go to the folder that I made, and Excuse me while I dig through all my folders. Lunch and learn, lunch and learn. Lunch and learn. Okay. So on this one, as you can tell, we have Rhino files, SketchUp files, SATA, all that good stuff I was just talking about. So I set that to G, DWG, and insert it. Okay. So this is the imported object here. So one thing you'll notice is. Um, it will get triangulated when you stick it in here and you're gonna see why that is important to uh, know about here in a second but uh, once I get this in here um, you can control the visibility and stuff like that so if I go to visibility graphics and I go to imported um, turn off my stupid view template so you go to visibility graphics and then you have a category for imported categories. 
So any imported object, whether it be SketchUp or AutoCAD or whatever, will show up here in this imported categories. And then um, depending on what program it comes from, you can um, override the appearance of it. So if I could go in here and change the color of the lines, for instance, to pink, and that's how you can kind of change it. You can uh, put materials on these guys depending on what type of import it is. But just know if you're importing a SketchUp or an AutoCAD or whatever, uh, it's important to note that it runs by um, runs by layers. So here I am in the visibility graphics override of imported categories. If I go down here to object styles, uh, this is my file. I can come down here and I can actually put a material on it as well. So anything that you import into Revit, um, it kind of has a level of uh, inter interoperability, <laughs> big word. Um, so you can kind of use it for some things, but once this gets in here, you cannot manipulate it in a sort of geometry way. So I can't go in here and manipulate the vertexes or do any manipulations to it, but I can change the uh, graphical nature. Uh, real world case study is, uh, we just did this in Arise Feltham. We took a SketchUp model um, Alex had to convert it to a DWG, but we stuck it in there and we were able to just override the materials and then turn on Revit's um, shadow machine to do shadow studies. Um, so I'm just trying to get the... So when I do this AutoCAD export, I have to figure out which layer it goes on, but um, there we go. Okay, so my material's not working very well. Um, I did change the material on this thing, but it kind of depends on how the 3D import was made, whether or not it will allow me to change its material. So uh, this one is not allowing me to change the material, but I was actually gonna use this for a different thing. So if we go over here and look at my other file here, so uh, this is another SketchUp file um, that we imported here. So you can see how it has triangulations and whatnot. Um, I can go up here to my imported categories and you can see all of the, the layers in there. And I'm not really sure which one is which because I literally just put this in here. But uh, you know these triangulations that you've seen um, what you can do here is you can go in and if, as long as I pick the correct layer, you can override the lines to white to get them to go away. Um, I'm not gonna waste too much time trying to pick all these, but um, Alex and I successfully did this for Arise Feltham and uh, it looked pretty good. Okay, so see how those disappeared? I'm picking the wrong layers here. But what I did was override the line color to turn it white to get rid of some of these triangulations. Um, so you can manipulate these to a certain degree. So if you are in the early conceptual stages, you can take your SketchUp model and put it in there as sort of a massing thing. Um, and then you can just kind of override it, but you can't adjust any of the geometry. You can turn things on and off by going to uh, your visibility graphics and then if I just pick all these and just turn them off so you'll see that everything went off. So you can kind of um, use those as adjustments. However, the cool thing, what you want to do in Revit is um, you can use these in a different sort of way. So um, this is a mass in Revit and uh, what you can do, I'm going to show you both ways here, but what you can do is you can use this thing to create floors and create walls and all this good stuff. So if you're just doing some massing studies, um, this creates floors based off of your levels. 
So notice when I select this, it also gives me the gross floor area of all of these floors in here. And if you've ever seen in your wall and your floor and roof uh, settings, you have a function called wall by face. So what this means is you can quickly go in and create walls, floors, and roofs off of these massing systems. Uh, floor. And then floor. And then floor. Give me floor. Anyway, I'm supposed to pick that floor, but it's hiding in there. We'll get that later. Okay, so another thing you can do with your conceptual massing from SketchUp or AutoCAD or 3ds Max or whatever is I'm going to go in here and make a mass and then once you're in the mass creation system then I go in and import um, the AutoCAD. So here is the same thing that I used earlier. I'm going to hit finish mass real quick and I'll move this over here. So now if I just grab this and if I hit mass floors and turn all of these on hit OK. Notice how it creates all of those for me. And then I can also go over here and do a wall by face, create my walls, whatever. And then if I just hide this real fast, you can see that it actually created um, floors and roofs based off of that geometry that I imported. So pretty fancy, huh? So if you're, you know, kind of working in SketchUp or 3ds Max or whatever, and it's like an, it's a better program for conceptual massing because you don't have all the rules as you do in Revit. So then you can kind of just take, if you're very strategic about it, you can take your big masses, import them into the mass system, and then you can create your walls and floors directly from that mass. Um, also, in the um, just using regular old Revit, if I go over here to Massing and Site, and then what I'll do is I'll create um, some masses in here. What is unfortunate and annoying in Revit, inside of the Massing environment, it doesn't really give you like proper modeling tools. So you sort of have to know how Revit models stuff. And this is why a lot of people don't really use this mass system because um, it's kind of confusing and it's not real easy. When I go into a generic model family or an in place, um, do a um, in model in place component, it kind of gives you tools where you're doing extrusions, revolve sweeps, or whatever. But if you kind of know how Revit does its modeling, it's not that hard. So whatever shape that I come up with in Revit, I can still do the same thing, add my floors, whatever. However, the nice thing about this is if I go in here and I change the shape somehow, I go up here and say, okay, there's that. Notice how those floor planes follow that new shape. And if I go up here and do my wall by face, boop, boop. so those are the walls based off of that crazy funky shape. If you're sort of new in Revit, you might be aware that uh, it's very, very difficult to do crazy weird walls like that. But this is the sort of best way to do this in Revit. And uh, the nice thing is if I go in here and then, um, you know, Suzanne says, I don't like that shape, go fix it. So then I'll come in here and um, I'll just grab this. Come on, give me a shape. Um, if I come up here and change this shape, okay, notice how the walls are not the same. I can click this wall and then say update to face, just like that. And then once I do that, I can then go into my floor plans and then I can see, you know, the uh, walls and stuff based off of whatever funky shape that I made. So, um, that's how you do that. So, going back to 
Oh, I closed it. Darn it. Too bad. Um, so when you import the um, geometry straight from the model, like this one, um, notice how if I go in here and try to do a wall by face, I can't do that. So Revit has to realize that um, this is just a boring normal imported object over here, but inside of this one, I can do wall by faces and all that good stuff like that. Um, because when you stick it into a massing family or um, it's not the right word because it's not really a family, but if you do an in-place mass or whatever, then Revit can read the 3D faces. And uh, it's, you're just kind of limited to um, geometry. So if I, whenever you go and um, do this crazy uh, science center or whatever next door to us, uh, notice how it does it in triangles. So it does this because the um, interpolation of the two programs will convert this into two triangles. But if you really want to use that geodesic dome, you can go down here and use your Revit jo joins tools. Hello? There you go. And then, then you have uh, one wall with no chunks. So, uh, flat means flat. What's going on? Somebody's talking. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not near that. <laughs> cool. Um, so, uh, does anybody have any quick questions over that? And then I have uh, another super cool thing to show you, and then we can uh, talk some more about all of this. But uh, does anybody have any have a, questions? I have a quick question about the uh, importing the files from another program. Are you are you able to link them so that you, if, if you're making changes like in the SketchUp file or whatever, you can uh, sort of update it in the Revit file? Yes, you and, can. And, yeah, you can you can link it yep. rather than import. Okay. Yep. Um, Linky CAD. Let me double check on that. Yep. So yeah, you can you can link them, um, and then whenever you save it, uh, you might have to reload the link. But yeah, yep, definitely do that. Good thanks. Um, I have a question, Devon, about um, say if you have multiple options of the one massing, like what is the best approach for that? Like, would you be better say if you're not going to add any detail, like floor plates and walls, and you're just looking at one massing structure that's going to be in the same place but you've got like six different options would you be better to uh like um matey asked would you be better to link in you know one by one your six different options and maybe um get renders from it or are you better to pull them all into the file as imported geometry and then organize it in such a way within your file that you've got all six of them and you're kind of toggling between each one? Good question. So, uh, number one, if you wanted to do um, area and space calculations, if I bring in all of these three and I just hit that magical button that makes the floors, it's going to calculate all three. So, uh, what you can do um, is import them separately. So, like in Max, you have the option to export selected, and then you can just do them as three files. And um, so, basically, when I export this one, that would be one AutoCAD file. And then um, then essentially all separate is the end question, in answer. <laughs> so, Because uh, normally when you're doing those massing studies, you want to calculate what is a cubic feet and blah, blah, blah uh, for your studies. So uh, you just have to be a little strategic about how you import them. But uh, I would, if this is option one for tower, this is option two, then just export them separately. Because when they're individual, you have the ability to uh, do it individually. So um, if I did uh, just one, one massing family for each tower, you could still have it in the same file, but um, they would calculate separately. Good question. 
how do you organize them so that you're only dealing with one at a time that maybe it's in the same place but you have six different options of the on the one site basically um so let's see so you can put these guys on um i think you can put these oh that's the imported one Let me just delete that uh, this guy so you can put them on work sets number one so um that's one thing you can do and then um you might end up just putting them in separate revit files for like each one and then link them together because that would give you the ability just to have the calculations for each massing part or whatever and then you can link them together to see the different options and then you can definitely put them on work sets and turn them off and on and stuff but uh it's just you have to be a little strategic because one you don't want each mass runs its own computation here and then um you have to be a little uh, careful there uh Matea, I think you were the one who worked on the Royal Beach, right? Yes. What was the um, pitfalls of, I believe you did, you just did the same file, and then, because um, you basically did all this in that file, right? Yeah, I did. Uh, well, I think the pitfall for that one was, I think it's specific to that project, just the scale of it was really difficult to, to keep track of all the all the masses, and especially because there's such a, a huge amount of elevation change that applying floor plates to each of them, like across the entire site, became kind of impossible eventually. But yep, yeah, it, it was it was pretty difficult to to keep organized in the in the Revit file for sure. Yep. So like in that in that case, uh, the yeah, the different elevation thing that's just a beast in itself, but. Uh, you could have uh, you know, done like the 3ds Max file or AutoCAD 3D even, and then uh, just link that, and then you could you know, throw this in here and kind of run those separately. Um, but yeah, so that was, a, that was a really tough one, but you did a very nice job on getting that information out. <laughs> yeah, but, um, I have a question kind of related to that, because on the Raleigh Beach file, we place them on design options yep so what would be the recommendation for that versus like work sets um yeah design options are kind of just a nightmare i always tend to use uh, you're talking about royal beach right yeah. um yeah i would have just put them on work sets and and that would allow you to turn them off but either or on that just the ability to turn them on and off but i always tend to go with work sets instead of uh design options just because design options have all kinds of other issues that are weird to manage so but yeah that that one is a very um big special project and uh hopefully we'll do a project review on that one and talk about that more specifically because uh yeah you guys actually did a very good job on getting the uh information out of that thing Does anybody have any more questions? And then I'm going to show you one other cool thing. And it looks like my awesome file is not going to upgrade today. Questions on massing? Questions on massing? Cool. So also um, in Revit, there are um, other ways to model things. Um, so this thing here was uh, a little roof portico study for um, I should probably turn my realistic mode off uh, this was for Disney and um, as you can see it's very Disney-y with lots of crazy curvies and whatnot um, but what this is this is a family and um, these things are nested and um, this is a little mass thing so inside of the um, uh, adaptive component families we have like different com uh, different abilities to model things so i'm just going to delete this real quick so how i made this thing was there i made two generic models so this little guy here is um this thing what you're seeing there is um a generic model family and all of it all as it is is a 2d profile and I basically just did uh, two profiles. Can I isolate you, please? So 
between these two profiles, we were able to do uh, sweeps um, that created this crazy undulating form here. So um, normally you would go into 3ds Max or Rhino. If you know Rhino, this is right up Rhino's alley. However, Disney um, demands that all of its modeling inside of Revit is done specifically in Revit. So that's why we had to come up with all these crazy stuff. So uh, I'm just gonna delete another one of these real fast. So we basically, this is inside of an adaptive component family. We nested two profiles. If I just grab these two profiles and say create form, Oh, I somehow have this other thing attached. Go away, thing. There we go. Can I get this one? Hide this one. I'm going to show you the super cool depth component in two seconds. I just want to thank you. Grab this, grab that. Create form, solid form. Okay, so see how I just did that? So take two profiles, stick them together, and hit create form. Um, the weird thing is, is you have to sort of know how Revit works because if I just look at this, how in the heck am I going to, where's the button for create extrusion or whatever, right? So it's sort of like you have to know the weird revit -y ways to model things, but it's completely possible. And then uh, these guys, these are another adaptive component family inside of another family inside of another family. Um, so what these things are, if I just delete that and then say create similar, there are things in Revit that I'm always going to get this backwards. Um, there's these, they're called adaptive components, sometimes called dynamic com components. And they're the only thing in Revit that allows you to manipulate things in three dimensions. So, um, have that whatever um, so you can grab this and move it it's a uh, I'd have to turn on the shape handles but did you guys see how that was able to stretch on that thing so this has four points to it and you just have to click the four points and then it stretches to it pretty cool huh So you can do some pretty crazy modeling stuff in Revit. It's just uh, you have to be half of an expert. And um, I'm definitely going to show you this crazy thing on another day because it's taken forever to upgrade. Um, but do we have any more uh, questions on any of the subjects we talked about? Want to see me do it again or anything? I, uh, Demi, I missed the part you, you were talking about the levels, how you put the, these floors on levels. Oh, yes. Good question. Okay, so um, it will read whatever levels you have in the building. So you just, if you, you know, this is like 100 feet tall, so you just have to create uh, more levels to get them to go. So whatever levels are in the project, it will... Uh, do for you. So if I just bust some more real quick in there, grab this and say mass floors. Then notice how it's picking up the new ones there. See that? And um, also, I, j I wanted to show you, I forgot to mention. Uh, so you see how I made this a twisty tower here? Whenever I did that in 3ds Max, come here. Um, it's not triangulated. It's not splitting up that triangle in 3ds Max, but once I import it in there, it's uh, doing the thing called interpolation where Revit is uh, taking a polygon and splitting it into triangles. And if your geometry actually has one of those triangles, it will give you two surfaces instead of one, like we saw on the um, the cube sphere, um, sphere. Make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yep.
Who else got a question? Oh, and I forgot to mention, by the way, if you are using mass families, um, by default, the mass is turned off in the view. So if you made some masses and then you went home and you come back and you turn it back on, um, the masses will always be turned off by default. So if you're playing with masses, you go home and you get back in here and turn it back on, you're like, where did my masses go? That's because you have to go up to this massing site button and hit turn on my masses. Or you can go into visibility graphics and uh, turn it on here. Because it's just a memory thing that Revit does, so it turns it off by default in case you're looking for a different one. Anybody else? Anybody else? You apply curtain walls in the same way, or is it a little bit more complicated with the geometry? Um, very good question. I totally forgot to say that. Thank you for doing that. Um, this file that I keep trying to upgrade is actually curtain system system. So if I grab this and kind of just copy this, yeah, there we go. Just copy that. Um, so this curtain system is specifically uh, made to work with uh, masses. So if I go in here and do a curtain system and I select a couple walls and then say create system, first it goes off of your curtain system settings. So uh, you have to go into the properties and set up your grids and, and blah, blah, blah. So notice how it gave me a beautiful curtain wall system. And then you can go in and add mullions and do all that as well. Come on, give me a horizontal. And then you can also go in and tab select. And then you can change these to uh, whatever panel types you have in there. Didn't like that one. Shut up. Give me back my panels. So um, just like regular curtain walls, you can go in here and um, put whatever in there. I'll put a door. OK, didn't like that one either. Um, when we use these things for massing, I actually have a super awesome file of an aquarium that one of my clients uh, designed. And we used this system here. And then instead of the curtain wall panels, there's a special Revit type called um, a, uh, hey Ryan, what was that thing I was just showing you called? I always forget the name of it. One second, I'll find it again really quick. Uh, pattern grid? Yes, pattern-based family. So you go in here and you have these down here, curtain, panel, pattern based, generic model, pattern based. So these two families are meant to, to be used with this. And if you've ever heard of Grasshopper and Rhino, uh, the algorithm plugin, this is what ties into Revit to make these crazy funky uh, shapes. Also what you can do is, um, uh, I'm gonna try one thing really fast here and might get stuck on it because I haven't done this forever. Go in here, create form, sort of form, and then I'm gonna grab, grab this. Okay, so you can also go in here and you can hit this divide surface thing, and then you can turn the mass into a divided surface then you add one of those uh, pattern deals so if I come in here and I'll add a hexagon pattern so see how I did that so um, by turning this into a crazy hexagon pattern I can then take this uh, divided surface and I can plug in some of those curtain panels and I can make this be whatever so I'll make this a octagon rotate and then these little patterns turn into actual panels in your um, in your model. So you can do some really, really crazy stuff with this. 
And of course, the awesome example is still upgrading. But uh, what we did in this aquarium thing was each of these patterns had a 3D geometry in the little pattern family. So when you added them to this, you got something that looks like a mesh um, that was a 3D that you could consider as like a 3D um, kind of like space frame, if you want to call it that. So you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with these masses, but a lot of people don't really use them much. So, any other questions? Questions, questions? Suzanne, do you have any questions for us? <laughs> I think she said no. Um, so, lots of cool stuff. And then, uh, you know, any crazy design you come up with that you can create in 3ds Max, I can tell you how to make it work in Revit, whether by importing it or reproducing the geometry in Revit. Um, these things are just a little specialized and um, only like crazy, crazy design firms, um, you know, that do skyscrapers and, um, you know, people in Dubai and stuff like that use these crazy systems. But it's very good to do basic, um, you know, massing uh, calculations and stuff like that because it kind of does all that stuff for you. Any more questions? It's quiet today. Mateo, who has, who has played with lots of masses, have, have I inspired you to do anything cooler with masses? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't know about the being able to import them and apply the wall, so that's helpful to know for sure. Yep. Just remember to do the wall calculation and stuff. You have to create a mass, either a family or an in-place mass, and then import them into there. Once they're in there, Revit reads that as something you can slap walls on. Tani, any questions? Don't be shy. And Mara, thanks for stopping by the Rivet meeting. But yeah, if nobody else has any questions, we'll call it a day. Get back to work. And then I also record. I also recorded this, so we will keep recordings. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. See ya. Thanks for stopping by. Be sure to subscribe and like and that notification thing and whatever YouTube stuff you guys do. Have a good one.